Uh, everyone, help me welcome today our speaker, Nurush Ashtari, who currently teaches graduate courses at the University of Southern California, Rossi School of Education. She received her bachelor's degree in English literature, master's degree in applied linguistics, and her PhD in education. Tissel? Tissel, right. Tissel. Both correct. Right. Um, she has taught and conducted research in various countries around the world over, over the last over 15 years. Her main research interests include technology and VR teach, teacher VR and teacher training and professional development, sociolinguistics, psycholinguistics, as well as heritage language learning. Without further ado, help me uh, welcome Nurush. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Lucas. Um, I'm Nusha, and as Lucas said, um, one of my main jobs is to uh, train teachers, or as a friend of mine says, it's like the movie Inception. It's a dream within a dream, so I teach teachers how to teach. Um, and oh, I was supposed to become an electrical engineer, then my life took a 180 turn, and then I took a turn with it, and then I ended up in literature, um, linguistics, and education which I absolutely love, but I'm still interested in merging engineering and um, education and seeing the magic that can come out of that. Um, one of uh, the areas of focus for my research has been using VR in teacher training programs, um, and that is the focus of this presentation. So a little bit of the background of VR, you probably know a lot of these just very um, highlighted um, timelines of the innovations that have happened. Um, just like anything else in the world, uh, any in innovations, um, they usually start with a figment of imagination. And that was the case with um, Stanley Weinbaum, who was an American science fiction writer. And uh, he wrote a short story about Pygmalion's spectacles. And Pygmalion is also from Greek mythology. Um, the sculptor who created a sculpture, fell in love with it, and uh, prayed to the gods and Venus uh, so that it could come to life. And that was the story. And also, this story is about a professor who invents a specific goggle that um, takes people that the users that use it into a very new world that they can see, hear, smell, taste, and touch everything, even though they're not there. Um, in case you're wondering about how the story ends, uh, he felt, falls in love with this woman, and then he finds out that it was just a virtual dream, which is great because I hate happy endings, <laughs> so it's good that it doesn't end that way. All right, um, coming to reality, uh, one of the first uh, innovators who started with taking that concept and bringing it to, into reality was Morton Heilig, who was a Hollywood filmmaker, and as you can see in the picture, there was a kind of a cabinet, a box, and you were surrounded with screens, and there were fans that would emit um, odors and breeze and things like that, so you could be immersed in the movie that was being played. Uh, unfortunately, because of lack of financial support, the project didn't really go anywhere after that. Uh, then we had even Sutherland, who was considered the father of computer graphics, arguably, and he created the first HMD, or head-mounted display, and it was called, called the ultimate display. And as you can see, because of the name, the Sword of Dem Democles, it was um, based on, again, a Roman anecdote about a king who was, uh, whose throne was placed under a sword that was hanging from the ceiling by a single thread of hair. Um, so it's a kind of like an analogy to um, the uh, power positions and how uncertain and endangered they can be. Um, and as you can see, that's because there is a mechanical arm that is hanging from the ceiling, and there's also a head-mounted piece that goes with it. And then there was Grip and Video Place. Grip was a um, glove that could interact with human touch. And um, Video Place in 1975 was a 2D screen that users could interact with. Then 
1982, we had VCAS visually coupled airborne system simulator. As you can see in the picture, it was an oversized head um, HMD, and um, it, it was used for training fighter pilots to see 3D maps and also give voice command and also eye movement uh, motion to um, navigate their flights as they practice. NASA came to play in 1984 with their virtual visual environment display, and um, they used it to train astronauts with 3D visual boards, and also, uh, for example, to um, get used to wearing space suits and how to uh, navigate their movements and things like that. It's still an ongoing process with different names and different concepts. And then Data Glove and iPhone in 1985 and 1988 by VPL, and they created the first commercial virtual reality device for public use, or the public could purchase them. Data Glove was very similar to a grope that was a glove that um, was interactive with human touch, and they also had an HMD that go with it, that went with it, that the users could use to feel immersed in a virtual world. And then there was Boom, binocular omni-orientation monitor by fake space labs. As you can see, there was, again, an a, not an HMD, but there was a um, set of, uh, there was a box that they could use to uh, see a virtual world and their eye movements would be adjusted to the movements of their character or the virtual um, character that they had. Cave in 1992, is a, it was an automatic virtual environment. It was mostly like a wall that had a virtual wor world projected on it. So for example, you could be in an ocean and then you could see all the fish and sharks and everything around you. They kind of immersed you in that environment. And then all of those, of course, we didn't cover everything, but um, everything that happened, all these steps were taken in order to get to AR in the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, which is where we are, that um, we usually use AR, which, which enhances what is already there. For example, fighter pilots, all the information that they have on their screen, uh, it just enhances their experience and navigation of what the, their mission is. Now, coming to the present time, you probably know more than me about everything that's happening in AR and VR. So I'm not going to focus on all these other aspects. For example, we had Oculus, we had um, HTC, we had uh, Morpheus Project by Sony, all these other projects that have been happening. What I'm going to focus on instead is going to be about virtual environments in the field of education. Uh, one of the projects was Myrtle, which is a mixed reality teaching and learning environment in University of Essex and Shanghai e-learning platforms. As you can see in the picture, it's very much like a <clears throat> video conference, but instead, for example, students or participants can create their own avatars and attend class as those as avatars. And they can raise their hands, ask questions, they can have a virtual board that they can write on, they can work in group projects, fair projects, so it's, it's a more interactive video classroom environment. And then there was the Marvel project, which was used for vocational students mostly, and um, there are workshops that participants can take part in, and they have virtual simulated machinery and activities that they can take part in. And there's Small Lab by Arizona State University. As you can see, it's a 3D uh, interactive surface that is projected from above. You can use it for different fields of study. You can teach math and science and um, astronomy and chemistry and all of those classes. And students can interact with the board. For example, they can move the planets, they can tap on them and more information comes up. And it also uh, tracks their motion and also voice commands. So it's a very interactive environment for them to learn. Going to more of a game-like environment, it's Sim School. Uh, teachers and students can create their own avatars, and there are different scenarios that they can follow. And then the, um, there are command, what are they called, bubbles, 
that come up and you can say, oh, do this, do, do that, or you can create a lesson plan that um, you can go on with in your classroom setting that you're teaching and also students who are attending your class. Then there was Second Life, uh, which as the name suggests, the purpose was for users to have a second chance of seeing different things, learning in different environments. For example, you can see that you can go to the Louvre Museum in Paris and then go and see different art collections, learn about them. You have all the information that you can read and you can interact with other visitors. So it's a very interesting uh, environment. Or you can go at a certain point in history, you can go to World War II, or you can go to different countries and see different um, areas first, second hand, not first hand, second hand. And then the environment that I've been working on uh, at University of Central Florida, I helped develop and have been working on for the past few years, uh, I also did my doctoral dissertation on, um, is Teach Life, TLE Teach Life. There are various versions of it. So this is the classroom version. You can also have, you can also work with individual avatars. And those avatars can have different purposes. For example, it's used in uh, the psychology department with counselors, um, in teacher training programs. You can, for example, talk to soldier, like a soldier avatar who has come from war and is dealing with PTSD and you can walk them through recovering from that process. In teacher training, you can work with the classroom environment and teachers can, teacher candidates, pre-service or in-service teachers can come and um, practice the teaching skills or strategies that they're learning in, uh, their, during their coursework. So just to give you an idea of how it is, let's see, we can play, oh no, yeah, I forgot I'm not connected. Is there a password that can be used? Uh, sorry. Oh, right over there. Talk five, sap lady. Okay, let's see. Guess. Great. Um, guess, Arizona right. Guess. Was. Uh, is that P O T F? Capital P O T F. In lowercase I V E. Fs. Yo. Did it work? It's still connecting. Okay. <laughs> it says checking network requirements. Oh, can't connect. Do I go with the first one or 5G? First one, right? Oh, you can't see it. Sorry. Let's see again. doesn't work it's okay we'll move past it connect it good Okay, we'll just try this. If not, that's okay. We'll go continue with the rest. I'm playing here. Oh, there you go. Great. Thanks. <laughs>
There is something really innovative and different happening where technology and teaching are starting to come together. In this new educational technology world, the University of Central Florida, along with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and our Teach Live computer simulated classroom partner sites have a lot of technology to bring to teacher education. We know what high quality teacher practice looks like. We also know technology. The University of Central Florida is a leader in educational technology for teachers. We have Teach Live, the only computer simulated classroom of its kind in the world, and we use it to help teachers and teacher candidates across the country improve their practice every day. What a teacher sees in the simulated classroom while teaching a lesson is a screen filled with animated students with distinct personalities. The avatar students represent typical students in an urban American middle school. Teachers can rehearse high leverage practices with our virtual kids and improve their teaching. So tell me, do you agree with what Ed said or would you add anything to it? It seems like that there, if there's going to be a storm, mm -hmm. then, you know, I think that would be cool to just have a big hurricane party. A hurricane party. Okay, so since we're talking about states of matter, what kind of matter are you going to have at your hurricane party? Well, I'm going to have like, like, the, like dry ice and stuff. It's like a punch with dry ice. Oh, dry ice. So what do you think? Solid, liquid, or gas? It's like solid because you can pick it up like you are saying. Kevin, what do you think about a real ice ice cube? What would be the state some matter might be involved in an ice cube? So Sean was thinking of one that wasn't dry ice. What would you think? Are the ice, cube, ice cube, that's like, that's classic. Okay. You know, right? It's like classic because it's like, you know, uh, liquid, but then you freeze it and this and it becomes solid, but then when it melts, it becomes liquid again. So for your little quiz, I'd like for you to, you can either write it down, take out your cell phone, what have you, and I'd like for you to give me an example of a solid liquid and a gas. And CJ, you can use your phone for this activity. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll text it to you. That would be, actually, you're gonna go into my soccer team and put in the number 11978, and you can answer the quiz online if that's what you choose to do. Oh, sweet. All right, thanks, class. Think about a value for X that makes that equation false. <laughs> what can we replace with that variable X that would make that equation not Which, true? Which, that makes it false? Yeah, that would make it not true. Not Sean. true, okay. False, um, not true. Okay, cool. Can we just pick, any, we could pick any number we want? Well, if you want to take that technique, yeah, give it a try. Pick any number you want. I'm picking zero, because I think zero, that's the best. Oh. Zero is a good one. Actually, I like zero. Why Why do you pick zero? Just because I like multiplying by zero because it's super easy. Um. Okay, so let's go ahead and do those calculations. What calculations do you have, then? Cindy? If you stick a zero well, in there. Well, because zero works because, like, you know, it'd be like, you know, zero times four is zero, right? And then plus one is just one, and then that doesn't equal three. So, boom, it's exactly. wrong. Exactly. Excellent. Okay. Hey, guys, I'm so glad you're back from lunch. I hope it was delicious. Um, we are going to jump right into science, so I need you all to get all the materials that we're going to need. As you know, it's on the board here like it is every day. So if there's anything that you have on your desk that we won't need for science, please go ahead and put that away. Who can tell me what matter is? Yes, Ed, thank you so much for raising your hand. Well, matter is just like, just like when you have molecules that go together, you know, it can be anything. It can, you know, be a table or, you know, anything. It's solid or liquid or gas. Oh, thank air. you. Okay, it's going to be air, it's everything. Sean, so I remember you saying you had a story to tell us. Do you want to go ahead with that? Oh, my goodness, like, okay, so, like, we're talking about batteries changing state, and it's so cool because our freezer broke, and my mom was really upset, and, um, but I was saying, Mom, it's kind of cool because we're watching, like, the, the ice turning to liquid, so it's changing matter, and she laughed so hard. She's like, you are just such a science brain. <laughs> Oh, Sean, that's a wonderful story. I'm so glad you were talking about what we learned in class to your mom. That's great. Well, we're all done. And as you know, the objective of your lesson was to go in with a STEM activity and engage the students. And so we have this Teach Ours video coding feedback tool. And I'd like you to take a look at the behaviors that we coded, the high leverage practices that we were looking at. So we were looking at questioning, wait time, and feedback. And as you can see, you had three instances of specific feedback. So I'd like you to think about that in terms of your objective for the lesson. What could you do differently next time? So we're all done with your um, reflection session. And I think you'll be pretty excited to know that the next session that we do is with Sean's mom, Jeanette. Thank you so much for coming in today. 
Oh, well, thanks so much for having me. I just, I'm really eager to hear how Sean's doing. Absolutely. I do want to talk with you about his progress here in science. Well, he just loves your class. He thinks you're a wonderful teacher. I mean, I'm sure you get that sense from him. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. I, it's good hearing that. Bye. Uh, there are different purposes um, that Teach Live is being currently used for. Hey, I just created a professional Wix site for my business. Let's check it out. Here we go. Check it out. Go to Wix.com. There. Good. <laughs> okay. So, um, and the ra ration is the rational be behind why we decided to use Teach Live in teacher preparation was because um, the traditional methods of teaching, even the ones that I was used to when I was uh, doing my education, they just do not work with current students. Um, there's a shift that needs to be addressed. And also, the teacher preparation programs that are currently in use um, provide limited practice opportunities. They might be very lucky if they have one practicum or two practicums very short during their teacher preparation programs. They have lack of exposure to real life scenarios and also uh, they, most of the questionnaires and also surveys that have been done um, report that teacher candidates do not feel prepared um, in a lot of uh, ways to go in and teach real students in real classrooms. Um, and also coming to talk to diverse student populations and English learners, immigrants, uh, especially in countries such as the United States with very high a number of English learners in classrooms. Um, approximately 85% of, uh, percent of new teachers don't even have seven hours of practice with English learners, but they go in and teach classrooms that are one third um, English learners and those learners get lost in the lessons all the time. Um, as you can see, and also you saw in the video, there's a green screen. Uh, screen. So this is the Teach Live lab, but the uh, TV set can also be drilled into different classrooms. So they, you don't have to be in the Teach Live lab to work with it. Um, there's usually a microphone and a connect set. As you're walking around, you're also walking around in the virtual classroom. So you can go and talk to, for example, Ed, Sean, have them do group work or a pair work. And there are different ways that you can use it. Um, there are different classrooms. This is the middle school. This is the high school or um, university level classes. So they're, they, if they're the same characters, but the grown up versions of them. And you can also work with individual um, avatars. So for example, Stacy, and you also saw um, Sean's mom in the video. So there are different characters and different um, ways that you can use the environment. Um, we talked about this, that um, there are EL versions, so English learner avatars, and how they've been developed has been through long-term research and case studies. So we went to different schools and gathered data from English learners from different levels of proficiency, beginning, intermediate, and advanced. And that way, three avatars were developed based on the data that was gathered. Yeah. The teaching cases, um, we had to match them with standards. We used WIDA standards teaching stuff. Um, and there's also the interview sound files are available for public view if you would like to see them, and then the three avatars, three English learner avatars were developed using the data. For example, Edith, she's from Mexico, she only moved here a month ago, and she has beginning level of proficiency. And all of these characters have their own distinct personalities. So for example, Edith is very shy, she doesn't talk too much, she has not been able to make many friends. So you get to know them as you work with this environment, and you know their background story, you can ask about you know, what they're going uh, to do, for example, during the day, and there's a set of answers that um, teachers usually can connect with that person or that avatar. Edgar, Puerto Rico, mainline US, less than a year, intermediate, and we had Tassir, who's from Egypt, 
moved here five years ago, even though when you talk to Cecile, you would think that she's, she sounds like a native speaker, but when it comes to her academic English, reading and writing, that's where she struggles. So usually we focus on reading and writing with Tassir when we're working with her. Um, so that's that with Teach Live and how it's used in teacher preparation. Um, we have partnership with different universities and colleges around the world. Uh, I am very new to USC, so I'm trying to see what is happening here and what can be done. Here, I, uh, in Rossier School of Education, they have uh, expressed interest in having VR and AR in their teacher preparation program, but currently we are not able to book with Teach Live due to financial constraints and things like that. So I am very much looking forward to seeing what's happening in USC and also what can be done. Um, so far, I've been able to see what is happening at the Institute of Creative Technology and USC Shaw Foundation. Um, they have a simulated holographic video of Alka survivor Pinkas Guta. And um, I can I have can show you the video. I think you've probably seen it, right? Um, okay, let me go to this one. And there we go. My name is Pinchas Guta. I will answer any questions you might have for me. My name is Pinchas Guta. Good. All right. I will answer any questions you might have for me. How old were you when the war ended? I was between the ages of 13 and 14 when the war ended in 1945. Do you remember any songs from your youth? This is a lullaby that my mother used to sing to me and I still remember it. It's in Polish. Jadą dzieci, jadą drogą. Toszczyczka i brat i nawidzić się nie mogą, jaki piękny świat. So that's how um, VR is currently being used, what I know USC is doing, but with that I open the discussion to you. If there are any suggestions or recommendations or places that I need to go to, um, also any ideas? collaboration or any questions that you might have. So these virtual survivors, uh, are they telling created stories or they tell actual stories? They tell actual stories, very good question. So the uh, picture that you had, I, um, from what I gathered, the way that they went about uh, about creating the environment uh, was that they had Pinkus Guta in a room, in a green room, for um, I think one week. Um, they filmed him eight hours a day, and they asked him questions, a lot of questions. I think they gathered a 1,500 question and answer database. So based on those, the recognition of the question, the answer is provided. So that's, so they're not. Yeah, I'm like, just this kind of stuff makes me worried about all those Alpha's deniers who are saying, right. you know, they can maybe let weaponize have a research to say, oh, see, I told you, this is all made up. Right, yes, I, and that's a valid concern. But also it, it provides information that from the very same person, the exact person that even later on, after there's no one to go back to, you can watch the videos and there's films that, you know, show that he was answering the questions. So that's a valid concern. Yeah. Yes. How sophisticated are the classroom agents? Um, for this one? Uh, or um, um, like the teach life. Right, for teach life. Is for there, uh, are they generating, uh, saying pre-recorded pre answers or? Great question. So there is a huge difference between how this um, VR system is created than how teach life is created. I was, I had to sign a lot of non-disclosure agreements and things like that, not to say what the secret of the sauce is, but um, I was here on October 4th, and there was a um, talk about human in the loop. 
uh, in AR. Uh, so that one has that aspect. So there is a subject matter expert or an or a SME that works with the human in the loop in order to provide the responses. So that one is way more real life than this one. Um, so that you can have completely different lessons and the avatars would be responding at that moment with that subject. There's a human behind every avatar? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a good question, but yeah, you can probably guess how it works, right? No, 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 that's completely okay, but that's, it's, it's a completely different, that one is more real life situation rather, rather than pre-recorded. So, so at ICT, they have all the, I mean, this is more recent work, but all their work, they have these training systems for like military and could take like some situation, like an right. accident, and, and you are, I mean, interacting with, uh, this avatar, but they were all kind of driven by the computer. They were not. Human. So I guess I wanted to ask the same question: What are the technology behind chat? Like, because I mean, the the voice, I mean, the answers from the kids are like pre-recorded. Because I mean, it was excellent voice generation. I think they were generated. From they were generated, but they're, they're not generated. They're okay. real life answers. So with life. with speech life, yes, that's why it makes it unique in a way, but also not completely VR. Um, but yes, so there's usually there's that aspect, and there's also um, as you could see there there's a coach that usually when teacher candidates come in to interact with the avatars there's a coach either standing um, behind or sitting on the side and they take notes of everything that's happening and you can pause the program so for example let's say a teacher candidate is teaching a subject and it's not working with the students they're not getting it there it's or they're making and there's level of behavior. So you can have them very well behaved in class or you can go to level five, which is they're not listening. They're just going in and out of, of the classroom. You could see Tassir texting the whole time. And then um, once the coach sees that the teacher candidate is struggling, they could pause the program. They could give them some hints and say, for example, let's try this or let's ask this question. What about we try this technique that we learned in class? And then they can practice and then they unpause the program. The teacher candidate can go on teaching it the same lesson a different way and they can see the difference in terms of um, the teaching and learning outcome. So it's that's why it's it's more it's used that way because with I mean so far with machines we haven't been able to reach that point of getting all the answers from different subjects with that. Things or suggestions for me to look into. Lucas was giving me some very good hints uh, to go after. But, um, but so you already talked like to John Bratch and that group in ICT. But these are the people who are doing all this in the John Bratch movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's that, 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 I mean, a lot of avatars and simulations. And, yeah. and then we have similar things. About, in mm -hmm. this case, was teaching military people, but right. they were in a situation and mm -hmm. uh, I still remember it was a, a while ago. Anyway, you have to culture and language, so they would have to make some gestures and, and so like provide kind of culturally appropriate interactions with the avatars. And if they didn't, then uh, bad things happen in the in the video. Oh. But if they did, then better things happened. Right. So um, it's but I mean, just there's, there's a lot of there's a really lot of expertise in, in ICT. I guess John Ratch is the person. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The similar thing. You know, make them teachers see the conditions that. You know, like soldiers for the first time seeing some conditions that go out of hand, grow out of hand, you know, and how do you, we're yeah. familiar with it. I mean, I don't know what they're doing, I mean, this is like, more, like 10 years ago, yeah, yeah, but yeah. anyway, they would go, it was like in Iraq type of thing, so they would oh, go to Iraq, and then they would have to have all these culturally appropriate things, like if they were talking to somebody, I think we took off the glasses, look at them, I say hi appropriately, right. or find what's the right person to talk to, so a lot of cultural uh, and language I think there was a company that started that. Oh. Well, it wasn't even earlier. But anyway, you should really talk to the Yeah, yeah to the so ICT this people. is so far what I gathered from what they're doing, but as you're saying, there's much more okay. happening. So definitely. Yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot more. Great, okay. <laughs> thank you. Is this also used to like, retrain teachers and professors? Like, so yes. they've already been teaching those you know, like, situations that they struggle with. Like, can you set up certain yeah. situations? Excellent question. Yes. So you can, once you uh, 
decide that you want to work with them, there is a form that you can fill out and you can say, I want to work on this specific skill. And you can be a pre-service teacher, in-service teacher, um, professor, any type of teaching um, that you're doing, and you can, you can adjust the program based on your needs. So that's definitely one thing that they can do. So the program will work for students to not take out their phones or their laptops and start being a... Yes, for classroom management. It's used a lot for classroom management. For lecture management. You know, <laughs> yeah, lecture management. Yeah. Door, you know, the door and everything to do in the evening. I know, right? <laughs> yes, yes. That, that's, yes, that's a lot of that. teachers come in to just do classroom management and they want to focus on specific um, skill that they want to work on. Yes. So I was wondering if you're looking at the flip side of the question. So rather than simulating students and have training teachers, why not simulate teachers and have them teach students, real life students? That's a great idea. I don't think with Teach Life they've done that yet, but that's something that is very interesting. I would love to do that. That would be great. <laughs> you, can, you know, record you know, good teachers who get like one awards and kind of right. distill what makes their teaching style effective and then you can synthesize copy the yeah, art kind of exactly. engaging teachers. Right. I, I, I still don't understand what Teach Life does. I mean, I know that obviously they have some kind of weird intellectual property thing, mm -hmm. but what does it do? So why is that better than having the actors just show up in a classroom and broadcasting that to the teachers? I mean, what's the, why the whole mediation through the avatars? So usually the teacher candidates, great question, so the, usually the teacher candidates that come in don't know anything about the program. And based on the data that I gathered, there's a suspension of disbelief in the beginning when they're coming to class and they actually think that those are their students. Whereas when you hire an actor coming in, they know that it's an actor or even when they do role plays teaching with their classmates in the classroom, it's always an aspect of, oh, you know what I mean, like you're my classmate, Just I do, I'm going to do this in my classroom. Uh, whereas this one, first of all, there's a coach and they can pause the program, they can teach you what to do and then you, you redo and you can repeat the, the same lesson many times um, until we perfect that skill. Um, so it's it's one other aspect but, 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 so, of teacher so, how, how, how varied are the situations? I guess there's some kind of a scripts and maybe some humor behind the scenes that is choosing what kind of a scripts to invoke right. at the right times. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know, but it has to be something like that for what you're describing. Um, is that the aspect that I mean, the kind of the coach that is behind the scene manipulating the actors is the right environment? How can it, is that the, Right, it's an additional tool. So they're all they're still doing the actors coming in. I mean, I haven't heard of hiring actors that much, um, but they do the classroom role plays. They go and um, observe classes outside of their teacher preparation programs. They teach classes, but this is one additional tool that is more guided for them um, to use. So. Yeah, I can see your point that, okay, so we're doing all of this for something that already exists. Well, but, I don't know yeah. how much about this is just, yeah. I, mean, I don't see what's there. Right, right, but it has, you know, it, it's shown to be an effective tool so far. Um, and it's, all, it's always getting better and getting enhanced. So especially from the very first prototype to until now, it's changed a lot. So hopefully it's gonna be a better tool as we move forward. Yes. Have you ever tried like having teachers like interact with themselves as a student? Like so like mm -hmm. like maybe recording like typical having them sit in like the student's perspective mm -hmm. and kind of see it from that. I think maybe mm -hmm. that'd be a cool teaching tool. The, the torture for mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't, I don't. That would be Oh, I well, not like just lecture, but maybe like if you have a question, you can watch how you typically respond to certain types of comments or questions during your class, and maybe it'll, that can maybe help improve. One thing that they do with these um, teach life sessions, they they record the sessions that teachers um, do with the avatars, so you can get access to the recording of your own teaching with the students. And then there's usually, depending on what classroom that is being used for, you can have, there are certain questions that you can reflect on your teaching. Um, so that's one way of addressing that um, area that, you know, they can, they can watch themselves teach. And then um, there's, there are forums and things like that that go with that experience that they can see. But the reverse side is still not there, but um, 
there are avatars that are used with uh, special needs students, and it has shown that there are case studies with, for example, autistic students coming in and interacting with the avatars, whereas it is a completely different experience when they're teaching to a real, real person or the avatars are very bubbly, they just keep talking and talking. It's a completely different set of behavior that these avatars are getting out of um, students with special needs. So that maybe that's something that adds to um, what is already being done in real world. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so how scalable is this? So the one that is a one-to-one -one teacher in one session and these robots needs to be there, or can you teach multiple teachers at the same time? How does that work? It's usually, it's you, they can, teachers can come in groups of three maximum, and then they can take turns, or it's usually then one teacher and the classroom. You, you could have like multiple teachers looking at the same classroom, and, right. and then see how they, so it, I mean, they don't have to know that all of them are, well, maybe they have to know because they're they all reacting. Right. Yeah. Seems like a scalability issue, scalability issue, but anyway, it's very really focused one to one. Right, it's mostly one to one instruction or one to two children. Yeah, one teacher with one. Yes. But then we have group teachers coming in and doing parts of the lesson all together, or three teachers working with different students at the same time. Because you can go walk up to them and talk to them, and then go and walk up to the other student. That's another way. They can be used. Notice that you mentioned that uh, there's a way to scale from uh, zero to quiet one. to you know right. unruly. Um, but what about for the learning styles? Is there a way to scale across that domain? Yes. Um, a positive thing about Teach Life is that you can adjust it however you want to. So you can definitely say, I want a classroom that has students with the, these types of behavior or these. Um, I'm going to teach this lesson. I want my students to already know these before I start to teach them. So you can definitely adjust towards the goals of your teaching experience. Right. Shall we thank our speaker? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And here is my contact information if anyone would like to get in touch, and merci, which is uh, Farsi uh, or Persian. I mean, it's, it's a long word from French, but I'm from Iran. So thank you for having me today, and that's my contact information. If there's any comments, suggestions, recommendations, I would be happy to hear about them. Thank you so much. Thank you.